Recording in progress. 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 Recording in it's a three o'clock yet. How about we just start? Sure. It's okay. Yes. So, hello everybody. So, today will be our last one for 2023 Great Musician. So, uh, we will w w welcome uh, John Doughty, give us a professional expert on uh, um, uh, uh, energy, uh, geography, ge geography, politics, geopolitics. <laughs> okay, welcome. Some of you might recognize me. I've been doing this for years. Um, by day, I am a chief investment officer of an investment firm. Yeah responsible for about $7 million, 300 million of it in energy assets. So I'm pretty, pretty in, I am a arguably an expert in energy. I've been on oil derricks in oil fields. I've met the CEO of Exxon, Chevron, so on and so forth. Um, I think, you know, we are kind of starting out with this cover here with, uh, this is uh, the Iraq war, but, um, I think the Russian invasion of Ukraine really highlighted, I think, to our friends in Europe, what energy insecurity is. Um, we are actually spoiled as a nation, given the vast resources we have. Uh, energy is cheap here. Um, I'll walk you through some math that shows you why I do think energy is cheap. Gasoline is frankly cheap compared to Europe and other places around the world. Um, but we'll speak, a, we'll speak a little bit about this. Um, in terms of what this means. You know, I think we all want an EV future, a clean future. I want my daughter to inherit a clean earth, but I'm also a realist. Um, we need a honest energy policy. I don't see it right now. Um, I see a lot of talk, but it's gonna take time. The transition is gonna take time. And I hate to tell Americans, but we're never gonna be fully weaned off of hydrocarbons. Isopropyl alcohol is a hydrocarbon. It's been used in hospitals by nurses, doctors. This plastic container is a hydrocarbon. I have two vehicles in the parking lot out here, largely hydrocarbon plastic around it, right? So we are gonna eventually get to this EV future. Um, and I think Elon Musk is certainly the driving force in that. Uh, but it's going to be tough. It's going to be a bumpy, bumpy, bumpy transition. <laughs> so in terms, of, in terms of our renewables, we have, as a country, from an electric generation standpoint, made some headway here. So I think there is a positive story to tell. This just shows you 2021 to 2022 in terms of our electric generation mix. And you can see that nat look, natural gas is a key component. It is a base load power source. We're not walking away from natural gas tomorrow. Europe is not walking away. We all want, again, solar and wind and clean hydro future, but it's going to take time. The transition will take time. Yeah, it basically shows that, that the uh, amount of coal used to produce electric generation in the country has declined. Natural gas is, is a, about 27%, 28% of base load power. Nuclear is right around 20%. Solar and wind have climbed up to 14%. So that's the positive story. But probably a decade ago, it was closer to zero. So that is a, that is a highly uh, high growth area. So that is picking up. Hydro is Who's 22? Yeah. No, 
Yeah, so you know, it's, it's a different, oh, so it's, it's really just a year, the, comparing the two years. So I, so I think the story here is we are making progress in terms of being in the future. It's just taking time. And again, I think if you look at this, from a decade ago, you can see much more. So we're making some progress. Do you have something similar about the collapse of the world or certain major power reasons? I'm just curious. I think I think we I think one of these charts does it. Yeah, I think I have I think I have a global one, not just country specific. But certainly energy is vital to national security. You turn the power off in this country, look, I mean, I live in Falmouth. We lose the power about 20 times a year. Um, it's you know, not fun. Can you imagine? <laughs> uh, it's really just vital. And Europe uh, showed us that. Europe just, uh, as of, I think, two weeks ago, they reported their first quarter GDP. It was positive. They avoided a recession. Basically, Mother Nature saved the bacon because uh, they're Natural gas inventories were not high enough to get them through a severe cold winter. And their winter was not severe, it wasn't cold. So that really saved them, as well as US LNG imports and imports from Norway and Qatar and other countries. But I think what it really did, what this Russian invasion of Ukraine showed us is that energy is really vital. Again, we take it for granted because it's basically in our backyard. But other nations, Japan, South Korea, that literally employ 100% of their power are already at risk. And so that's why I think there's this geopolitical dynamic. You know, look, the oil business is a dirty business. There's no two ways about it. Again, I've been in oil fields. You can just watch TV, watch a YouTube video. You can see how dirty it is. It's not a clean business. It is environmentally unfriendly. Clearly, you're drilling into the earth, you're pushing chemicals into the earth to extract resources. But I think, you know, we can't kid ourselves too. The EV transition to lithium, graphite, and other things that we're going to mine from the earth, it's going to be a dirty transition experience. These are all very, very dirty and dangerous businesses. And it's expensive. Um, you know, these off, offshore oil drilling systems, uh, you know, can cost into the billions of dollars. And as we saw with the BP, BP Macondo disaster in the Gulf of Mexico uh, years ago, they can be environmentally disastrous in terms of you know, when things go wrong. What changes are you with I walked around with a heart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I got it. It's very interesting. I mean, you know, I, I think what's most interesting is if you look back probably 10 years ago, the shale revolution in this country, um, the United States, we innovate. And that's the one thing. You know, we, we're fighting this debt ceiling crisis right now. And every, every, someone was talking about the news being negative all the time. You know, we do a lot of amazing things as a, as a nation. I mean, I just look at my iPhone and what this, and, and, you know, it's pretty amazing stuff. And and what uh, and you may not like the energy industry, but they drove me here today. They're going to take me on vacation in June on a jet. You, you know what I mean? Like someone was on a, a cruise that wasn't a sailboat. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? So yes, uh, men and women are risking their lives daily on some of these offshore oil rigs to to bring that. That's that's basically a barrel of oil. 19 gallons of it will go to gasoline, 10 to diesel, about 4 gallons to jet fuel, the rest to other, other products and chemicals. And again, you know, not to get too scientific here, but you hear light, sweet, sour, uh, crude oil grades. A heavy grade of crude at 
times is the heat ejection would be moved through pipeline. So heavy, heavy crude oil is a dirtier crude. It generally you know, costs uh, less. I mean, it costs more because it's less more to be refined. Yep. That I don't know. Uh, to be honest, I don't know. But, I, but as I noted, so we, I mean, we are addicted to oil, for better or for worse. And I think we're trying to make this transition. And in, in terms of automobiles, we are we are making that transition. The uh, the new contract for the postal service. It's going to be a largely EV electric vehicle truck. That's just one example, but certainly EV sales, I think, is a percentage of total U.S. auto sales. And that's still single digits in other U.S. sales. The Chinese are making very, very good traction. China is a better adopter, I would say, right now in EV than we are. They're the leaders in battery technology. And they make a pretty darn good electric vehicle. So I think, you know, using them as an example, the United States is trying to catch up. Musk is really at the vanguard uh, in terms of the Western world. Um, and I just saw today that they're, you know, starting to build a, a lithium uh, processing facility in Texas, so bringing some of that battery construction to the United States. I think flying by, by a non-hydrocarbon-based um, energy source is going to be a, probably a little bit Airbus and other firms are working on electric aircraft, but that's still going to be a bit of a tall order. There's just, you know, the weight of batteries right now. MIT certainly is working on different battery technology and the chemistry behind batteries um, to, to lighten the batteries, but that's the key, the key killer of the battery requirements. We, uh, we own John Deere stock, and so we were speaking with the management team, and we asked them, are, you, are we going to see an electric uh, combine? And they said it's going to be a challenge right now because if you had a big piece of farm equipment with an electric battery, it would weigh too much for the field. And so at this point, it just doesn't, it's just not feasible. In other areas, it certainly is feasible. Lawnmowers and things like that. Um, you know, the there, 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 Yeah, I, so look, there have been experts for decades. I've been in the business for 30 years, and I remember all 30 years, you know, the two big things I've heard is the, do, the decline of the dollar, which has an and, and peak oil, which I haven't really seen that. And I think that, I think the shale revolution showed us that we can utilize technology to unlock heretofore reserves that we didn't have in the long term. Now, as the Arctic melts, and this is where it gets a little scary, as the Arctic melts, you know, Russia and other uh, countries and companies are thinking about ways to exploit those resources. And that's a pretty um, delicate so a VP might find a disaster in the Arctic sulfur environment. It could be I mean, obviously devastating. What about hydrogen? Hydrogen. Yeah, I mean, yeah, hydrogen is being worked on. Absolutely. Yeah. So all these different technologies are being tested. We don't have them in the States. Yes. Yeah, I mean, so this is, you know, this is where you kind of 
It can't be Marie Antoinette. You can't have your cake and eat it too. <laughs> Might have to pick one. <laughs> uh, lots of plastics. Anybody with a pink pony knows? Yeah. Every pony. Plastic bottles. I'm not a fan. So this chart here just simply shows the tight reality of world consumption, which is in red, it's that red line. And the blue line shows world production. They're very, very close. Uh, this is why you can have a shock. So if the Saudis were to say, we're going to cut production by, say, 5 million barrels, eventually that would shock the global energy markets and you'll see this increase in price of or vice versa if other countries were to increase production. Julian, is that drop from COVID? Do we have any more testimonies to that? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and that has been a challenge for the energy industry as well because just like a lot of businesses slowly shut down, the energy industry, they laid off a lot of folks during the bottom of this. Hiring those folks back has been a challenge. And I think part of it is, I mean, that while, while they are well paying jobs, other jobs now are paying. As you can see by even the quick service restaurants and McDonald's and stuff are paying much more than they ever were before. And again, this is very, very dangerous. Yeah, and that, that raises an excellent point. I think one of the areas that's disappointed me is, you know, I remember growing up as a child with conservation was a big, big thing. You know, turn on the TV and, I mean, that, what I remember from that as a young child was that the, you know, just a conservation movement. And I don't think we have that today. And I think it's a part. It's not, we don't solve our problem indulgence in these types of plastics and things like that, but I think it can help. So, I mean, that's, we, we still import oil. Our friends, to refine in some sense somewhere else, but also in some, some cases to use here, and that has to do with the placement of refineries. So, I don't think technically you can say we're independent, but for all intents and purposes, we can produce a lot of oil. Well, I'll, I'll show you a chart. It's it's pretty close. It's pretty close, and the oil industry has pulled back a little bit. Years ago, when the shale revolution hit, we were producing significant amounts of oil. That number has not reflected. We're not producing that much oil, and it really got to the point where with too much U.S. production was really hurting oil prices and killing the business. So that's changed. But I'll walk you through that too. I mean, I, I'm not here to defend the oil industry. I'm just here to kind of lay, that, lay out the facts, okay? I mean, everyone here decide. Um, my, my point about showing these types of things and telling you about isopropyl alcohol is that it's going to be here. Someone's going to have to extract a hydrocarbon and refine, unless we come up with new technologies and things that Chat GPT hasn't figured out this yet, right? Which in and of itself is a, that's another discussion topic. Right? Can you synthesize <laughs> Can you synthesize it? It's going to cost more and perhaps more than it costs. <laughs> uh, this chart just shows you um, OPEC uh, crude oil production, million barrels per day. And that did drop off as well during the The next few charts, I'm not, I won't spend too, too much time on, and I will, I will full disclosure, so the next three or four charts are from ExxonMobil. Uh, the reason I utilize those is so ExxonMobil and BP, and maybe Royal Dutch, 
well, for, they, they have they employ a lot of uh, not only PhDs but a lot of applied science as well. And they forecast hydrocarbon usage, quadrillion electric BTUs produced uh, across the globe. And, and so that's why you know we, we just use them as a touch point. Even though the bottom line from this is that you know, by 2050 they're seeing 70% growth in the energy needed for electricity generation. Now, they don't say what that source is. I mean, they have their, their view as to what it may be. It's going to be a combination of everything for the most part. But so, for example, China, we know, is, is the leader in solar photovoltaic voltaic equipment. So they're 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 really leading the charge in renewables, but they're also building out a lot of coal plants too. So they have like a dual kind of a bar bar approach, right and left. And in terms of so energy use by in, in sector, so the way to look at this is 2021, 2030, and 2050, green is transportation in the far right. So you can see they're just showing you that. Oil is still going to be, in their view, an important power source for transportation. Now, in terms of electricity generation, they see natural gas increasing, coal decreasing, nuclear increasing modestly, but wind and solar really almost tripling by 2050. And this, this is global uh, energy and electricity production. So there's in their view, again, this is Exxon's view, but I mean, arguably the way things are kind of playing out here, it does appear that this is what this is what they're saying. And I think I think a lot of this comes to cost. A lot of this comes to um, if we look at the emerging economies. You know, I'll ask everyone here: Do you think it's unfair for us to dictate that India become a solar leader? They're kind of in a certain phase in their industrial production. When, when we went through our industrial revolution, we were drinking coal, right? Why can't they use it? Why can't they use the cheapest source that they can extract to, to fuel their economic growth? It won't have to play, right. So, so then the question is, do we help a lot of African nations that you know have cheap, say, natural resources to use, do we help them Pay for renewable sources that are cleaner for the Earth's environment, and that's something I think that the United Nations wrestles with. Right? Like, where does the money come from? At the end of the day, right? Right. But I, I think I, have, yeah, in like four slides or so, I've got to finish. Up. So, in terms of overall energy demand. 2050, most of that energy, and this is just energy created and what it's used for, most of it is still going to be of electricity followed by industrial usage. And you can see on the far right, 2050, the United States, our demand goes down modestly, China's increases, but we'll have other non so that's that's really the growth of the rest of the emerging world. Yeah, I was going to say that we think so much about cars and airplanes, but it's it's not that big of a segment segment compared to the others. Right, right. That's interesting. And it, and it kind of reminds me of this whole conservation movement. I remember years ago, you know, Japan was having. one point they were rationing out like air quotes here um, air conditioning usage and they were telling their citizens on certain days you can't use air conditioning I mean air conditioners use a lot of base load um, and if you, if you can wean yourself off from that like I couldn't for example I have um, modest asthma so super high humidity is not good for me um, so there are certain cases for that like you, you want air conditioning you know, in the office buildings, do you really need it? Um, 
maybe, and I think they were telling people, you know, you see it's more just a sports show like this, and they're always seeing it. And that, you know, and that, and that cuts down that. I'm going to jump forward to my fun slide. So this is my favorite slide. So this is the desert. This is, I think, the Sahara Desert, where you see the big box. And what this is telling us is that if we had solar panels across 25,000 square miles, which is basically the equivalent area of West Virginia, you would create enough electricity to power the you could turn the lights on in your house, you could turn the lights on in Tokyo, you could do any, all the power. That is the power of the sun, of 25,000 square miles of the sun, which is, you know, by our standards, tiny, right? And by sun standards, really tiny. And for a chemist over here, uh, you know, the whole hydrogen, whatever, of the sun, I mean, it's just an enormous power source. So, so am I saying in this, this slide here that that will be built and will power the earth. No. But what we are saying, <laughs> right, right. Or products to drink, right? But, but if you think about this, I mean, you know, if we could build part of this, let's say we build maybe one one hundred of this to create enough power to power most African nations, to create enough power to run water desalinization plants along around the African continent for clean water. So it could be a solution to, to the climate. But as you stated, it could be a solution to any area in the world that has uh, a lot of urban area. And we do get the whole contract for creating the whole clean water. Yes, it gives us the whole contract for the whole clean water that we have to have to have water. Right. Yeah, the whole thing. So it's different. You know, I'll tell you, as an energy investor, you kind of scratch your head because that's that's really not their core competency. Royal Dutch Shell has tried it. BP has tried it. It's almost like a shell game. They'll, they'll invest, say, $200 million in this stuff. That's, that's a rounding error, really. So, so I get in trouble with kids. Something tells me that this, this is an Exxon slide. <laughs> no, I, as a matter of fact, I think this is an Elon Musk. Yeah. No, and I, I'm, I, I, and again, I, I'll sing his praises. I mean, Elon Musk, let's, let's set aside Twitter, let's set aside the tweets, let's set aside his political, okay? I want to just, I want to just focus on the, the person who's leading the charge at AV. He's, he's re, redesigned and watch the videos of drones flying around. He's redesigned and made it functional. He's the one who came up with the idea to order the largest press from a company that makes them in Italy to 
to, to basically like create one, one pressing motion to make the body of the Tesla to lower the cost to speed the production up. It's like it's like the Liberty ships in, during World War II are like, cranking these things up. He really deserves a lot of credit for that. And don't get me going on space because I also give a big I give a tour of the space presentation. There's no one on planet Earth who's more important to the conservation of the solar system than Elon Musk. How long would it take us to go from that to I'm looking at the chemist. Yeah, Yeah, we'll touch on that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so on the left here, this is just kind of the big three, if you will. Total oil producers. This is 2021 data. Pretty quick stuff. U.S. largest oil producer in the world, Saudi Arabia number two, Russia number three. In terms of natural gas producers, U.S. number one, Russia number two, Iran number three. Um, so, in terms of Petroleum consumption in the United States, that's the blue line at the top of production. It's the brown line that came first. The blue line shows you the imports. The yellow 
shows that you can have sports and you can connect with kids pretty close to the ground. So, so it's pretty fun. It's a pretty fun sport. Um, I think I have some cool graphics for you. Yeah. Like that? <laughs> so, OPEC still accounts for about 80% of global food and oil reserves. But again, we really just other areas that account for some of those, but certainly there could be more elsewhere. So the Middle East is still important. I think I think the you know China has become a bit of a power broker. The United States is not as involved. We can get into the politics of it, but the United States and Saudi Arabia are not really seeing eye to eye right now. So China has stepped into that void as they should. And uh, and filled it. So they are kind of working with the Saudis and the Iranians. And well, my reading of the slide is that you know, from down the Middle East, South of South America, that's basically open. Is that correct? Uh, yes. About three quarters of the South in reserve. Well, I guess I threw a tank. <laughs> so, okay, so fun fact about the M1 Abrams uh, main battle tank of the U.S. Army, it can run on Chanel, Chanel number five. <laughs> so, so, so I, I, I'll skip around in a minute, but so, so right now the administration, and again, I, I just want open discussion here. I want an EV clean future, right? I'm just a, I'm just a realist. So, the administration is telling us that the United States military needs to be fully EV by I can't remember, like 2030 or something like that. The fit, what is it? 2035. Okay. So, so, so look, it's one thing if you have like, you know, your Cape Cod neighbor base or whatever. And I just gave all the secrets away to everybody. You know, driving around in a little military truck that it's EV. I got no problem. You're in another country. You're on an island somewhere in the South Pacific. You're fighting a war. I'm fighting a war in, say, Africa. Well, there's gasoline and hydrocarbons all over this planet. Gas stations. There's gas stations in the, the Congo. There's gas stations in Miami. There's gas stations anywhere I want to inflict war on this planet. It's not electric. There's not electric power. And, and, then, and then you get into this John Deere issue. That's a very heavy piece of equipment. You put, you make that a battery-operated vehicle, and then then you can't um, operate on certain terrain. You can't go up certain inclines. It just, you know, it, it just creates a big problem. Now, again, our friends at MIT and Caltech and other places are trying to change the chemistry of the batteries to lower the weight. So maybe we'll get there. No, I'm not saying never. I'm just saying that we'll get there. That's the problem. So we have the oil price in the economy, you've got an arm in the leg, the price is still up. You know, it, I mean, oil, oil really does touch a lot of the economy. Certainly companies like GE that make general aircraft will be, which is incorporated. Uh, you know, they might be in jet aircraft companies, they're very connected in oil companies. Consumer is certainly. Airlines and high oil, oil prices lead to high jet fuel prices, and that is not good. That puts mass on consumers and constraints profits for all of those folks. So I kind of have Goldilocks here because you can't have prices too high because that will just break everyone's back. But you can't have them too low because then the oil companies are just not incentivized. I mean, at the end of the day, look, we are all capitalists, like it or not. I go to work every day because I'm getting paid. And I love what I do, so I'm fine with it. But I go because I'm getting paid. Right? 
we work for money uh, for the most part. Look, I, I'm not going to go in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico and risk my life for nothing. Right? Exxon's not going to, Chevron's not going to, none of, no one's going to. And so that's why you really need this bit of a kind of a movie lock scenario where you're getting a certain amount uh, too much or too little. Petroleum products consumed by end use really just about half of it goes to gasoline, 21% goes to diesel, heating, 8% jet fuel, and then the rest is just kind of spoiled. And you know, if you look at consumer spending, um, we have very, we have on the right side, we have like the wealth effect. The wealth effect basically is. Stock market's up, your 401k is doing well, home prices are up, you're feeling good about yourself. Okay, I'm gonna go on a vacation. I'm gonna buy a new set of golf clubs because stocks are doing well, my house is okay, you know. That's the wealth effect. The income effect is you're employed, you're gainfully employed, uh, are your taxes, wages, and gas prices actually affected? The University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Survey that comes out uh, every month shows us that gasoline really affects the psyche of people. It's really fascinating. Gasoline. If you think of all the money we spend on stuff. I've got a great example on Starbucks. You'll drive to the local film of Starbucks and spend more there than you will on gasoline. The goddamn price of gasoline goes up and we're all, we're all kind of crying out. Right? Live in France and cry about gasoline prices first. Certainly, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of Americans employed in this industry. So. It is a boom bust business. Sometimes things are good, sometimes things are bad. So it is not it is not an easy business to be in uh, or uh, certainly invest in. And you can kind of see that here. The uh, orange line is the price uh, per barrel of oil. You can see that back in. Seven and kind of all sticking on this spiked way up, up and down, up and down, 70 bucks a barrel. The blue line is crude oil production, and you can see on the far right there that line still has it's not eclipsed where it was right around prior to the pandemic. So we're still not back to that point yet. The oil companies are fine with that, they're not, they're not going to be. During COVID, the price for oil was very, very low. And then for crude oil, that the consumers of this particular was in hospital beds and COVID 19. And that's how it was when you look at 2019. <laughs> yeah, I think it was right, right about when, uh, right as we entered the pandemic, and then it just fell like a Yeah, well, so the way to read this is, um, yeah, so the price of oil yeah, certainly is extremely volatile. And, you know, it went down to below $20 a barrel. And that can really break the numbers. I mean, these, I mean, I, I think one of the things folks don't appreciate is, you know, when, when BP decides to develop an oil field, sometimes these projects take 20 years to actually, from, from the start, from the point where I start investing in the field, I actually start pulling hydrocarbons out of the ground and making oil. That's a long payback period for folks. You know, so, so that's why you know there's this angst in the oil industry that they just want certainty from whatever administration's in power. And you can even see it in this natural gas. So this is the price of natural gas. It spiked up on the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but then it cratered. Mother Nature gave folks a break in terms of the uh, weather. So, is the LNG included in the United States in terms of really the textbook for the oil? Is it all out of the Gulf? Yes, it all comes out of the Gulf Coast. Okay. So, the LNG is totally inexpensive. Uh, 
That's probably an input. Most of the inputs were on Dropbox. So China's China's actually considering a ban on wearables. So there's a lot going on with uh, we're trying to control chip technology going to China. China actually has really a stranglehold on a lot of the wearables production in the world. You know, from a geo kind of a political and global deglobalization kind of basis, these next two slides really just look at electric vehicles. So these are the, um, the minerals required for most of these electric batteries, right? And if you look, most of these things are produced outside the United States. I'm not saying we don't have the resources. We do have a lot of these resources. It's just, I mean, look, uh, we're not, we haven't invested. So, 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 right. So that's the key risk here. So, so look, we are the king of the world when it comes to everything. Whether it's Bitcoin, Texas, you name it, right? And that's been pretty good for the United States. It's development over time. In terms of these other assets, other countries own them. They are going to be. They're going to play tough with them. You know, I, I I started out on Wall Street <laughs> covering a lot of the mining companies. It's, it's a pretty scary business. Um, you look at mineral mining in Papua New Guinea, mining soldiers and stuff like that. It gets get dirty and dangerous. Uh, this is current. Yeah. So, so basically, seventy percent of graphite graphite uh, is being mined out of China. But the next slide is the key. All of these things, generally coming from all these different countries, go primarily to China to get refined, which is a dirty business. And then they get processed and sent to South Korea, the United States, Japan, or to be, you know, to be made into batteries. So, so again, China is important, <laughs> and and you know, we can't throw deglobalization around too easily. We rely on China. China relies on us. I think it's a bit of a symbiotic relationship. It's like a, it's like a family. You know, sometimes you get along with your brother. Sometimes you don't. So this this is you know the risk of this. Oh, I think they do have enough for this one, but I think they have to get more. And I think on 60 Minutes on Sunday, last Sunday, they had uh, one of the largest deposits in uh, California, Southern California. It's being developed. Yeah. China and Russia have really outplayed the United States in terms of focusing on minerals, but focusing on It's funny, I have access to Gallup data. When you think of Gallup polling in Africa, African nations actually like Russia. Hey, Russia's actually nice. They built our school. Oh, they're exporting our children, but they built our school, they built our hospital. You know, I mean, so, so the Russians and the Chinese, certainly they're, they play by different rules. But frankly, they're arguably well liked and have gained access to these coal companies. Yeah. 
But there's, well, let's put it this way. If you're in charge, I'm giving you pillow in your hand. So you're like, you're the, you're the leader of one of these nations. Or, you know what I mean? Like they're making certain. So yes. I'm gonna can I I'm gonna address the representatives. And that's what I read. Right. And so it seemed like everybody that we think we think of ourselves and somehow that's gonna break down and it's gonna affect everybody. Yeah. Jane, is there a These are just some of the primary drivers of oil prices. Geopolitics plays a big one. We, we certainly did see Russia weaponize natural gas uh, during, the, during the invasion. We still don't know who blew up the uh, Nord Stream pipeline. The intelligence came out that pointed towards the Ukrainians actually doing it, getting on some, I think, a German silver or something like that. And I'm sitting here with more early Russian ships were there. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's like this. It could be the greatest like spy case that we'll never know the answer to. <laughs> you know, and certainly. You know, China is uh, doing things in South China Sea that we don't like. It's making islands. And I, and I think, you know, certainly, you know, to your point about China being a big importer of hydrocarbons, you know, South China Sea is vital to them. And so I think they were out there kind of protecting their water. Yeah, okay, yeah, I didn't want to dig too much into this, but so, so this so so this is the, one of these um, islands in 2009, same island in 2015. And, and the International Court of Justice has said they're in violation of the Hamlet Convention. But why is this important? Because look at this 40% of global liquid natural gas moves through there. If you look at the distribution of liquid natural gas, almost half of it goes to Japan. So Japan imports its water. South Korea, China, 17%. So, so you know, you could argue from a naval perspective, controlling that area is important. Now I will tell you if you want to, to know to know the latest and greatest. So the United States Navy arguably controls the Strait of Morocco. This is the most important piece of real estate probably in the world. I think if you want to choke off China from a military perspective, but China's making definitely more initiatives here than they are in Europe uh, for for pipeline access and things like that. So they also uh, they just came back from Laos and they they've built a bullet train. Chinese 18 wheelers are going north all the time, loaded with minerals and they're just sucking wells. <laughs> and it's, it's interesting. They're doing this practice just for the fun of it. They're just, they're, they're really working on it all the time. Mm -hmm. And so to secure their border, they do that for free. It's an issue that they face. Right. All right, so here's my map. I'll let the chemistry professor prove me wrong. 
Okay, so 128 ounces in one gallon. Barrel of oil is 42 gallons. So in order to fill a barrel of oil, which costs $80, it actually costs like $73 today. I did this like last week, it was 80. It would, it would, it would basically it would cost you $1,000 $1,075 to fill up a Starbucks. I guess my point is, you know, there's a presentation for people to the shipping of those coffee beans. Okay, all right, so here's my profit slide, all right? All right, so work with me. Everyone loves items, right? Year up. Look at that, 25.2% five year operating margin. Operating profit margin is a five year average. Wow, that's not. Awesome. They're, they're just choking America down. 7.3%. There's this whole, there's this whole like, again, I, I don't have a dog in this fight. I just, I just want the facts out there. Oil, oil I, I mean, I mean, look at McDonald's, 41% margins. Now, I like McDonald's, all right? So, I, you know, my wife, it's my, one of my. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we can, we can compare, uh, what, you want to compare Apple to Exxon? Yeah. 7.3%. Yes. Sure, but I mean, how, do, how would you do it economically? Would you, would you tell an oil company that arguably it's a pretty dangerous business and you have to have a lot of insurance for your crew? Would you say you have 2% profit, whereas IDEX or REX can drop down to 30% profit? I mean, it is it is a free market system. Well, the market for this means the equipment has a tendency to transportation. You know, you've got different aspects of the economy where you know you're going to need certain things. You don't know that you're going to need to sell a certain number of dollars at once. But you can depend that there's going to be a certain number of miles driven each year. And so that depends. Tendency is also part of the entire plan that's being prepared. So it, it's just a different uh, way to compare the entire consumer products versus really, you know, basic need. You know, people don't like to think that they need basic need to get into the I think when you look at the value of things generally, you know, for example, crude oil. I think another way to look at this is if I put up as let's put it this way. I'm a lot richer on IDEX stock than I am on Exxon stock. Anybody who has a 401k with IDEX and Exxon. There's two dogs in this fight, not IDEX. Do you want more Exxon? <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, it's all it's a very big thing. It's pretty well understood. Well, it's for everyone. Everyone's a stuff. And I just think that the comparisons are really important. I get what you're doing. I see where it's going. This all kind of started in 1870 with the birth of Standard Oil. Not too, not too long after that, I think. To, I think some kind of question over here, but you know, World War One certainly was was really the introduction of economics. It was really kind of, and if you look at kind of all these examples I put here, the tank, the aircraft, flamethrowers, some. So it was really the first war to think about hydrocarbons fueled a lot of the economics of weapons. And certainly it was a major oops, it was a major objective of the Germans in World War II to fuel the German economy on war machine. And certainly Japan, who really So if we look at the fiscal break even by country, Iran's a little skewed. Normally it's lower, but given the sanction environment, it's their economy is in kind of tough shape. But you know, on average, $114 break even marketplace. So these are all petro states to balance their budgets. Saudi Arabia about seventy. Well, to kind of have a kind of a balanced fiscal budget, I guess it's a good thing. So this is the only place we need to be to put away the budget. So this has a lot of budget that's also impacted. Right. Is Norway a small plan for who? Is Norway a small plan? I mean, Norway is a, certainly a resource, resource rich. No, they're they're a fairly large oil producer and natural gas producer. In fact, they stepped up their natural gas production to help with with the European partners during this whole crisis. And that's and that yes yeah, yeah and that's where right and that's where this data so the data is from uh, primarily the IMF it's as accurate as it can be but you're right I mean, <coughs> you know, even the Saudis are buying Russian oil it's the 
so they could have price capped at 60 bucks. 60 is less than 73 that it's trading for right now. So and the Chinese are, and Indians are buying it right now too. So um, U.S. Um, well, we're going to get the global defense country uh, spending by country. The United States leads, followed by China, India, Russia, UK, Saudi Arabia, Germany. Right. Now, we can get wonky and talk, talk about purchasing power parity. Dollar in China goes a lot farther than it does in the United States. So, in some respects, we're not comparing apples to apples in this chart. This is kind of the data. And I think the way to think of that is after World War II, the United States was a global leader in power. And clearly the United States Navy and to a lesser extent our government and other forces have kept this global sea lanes open for commerce that every country has benefited from that puts something on a ship from point A and moves it to point B. And not that piracy is a major issue, but the fact that you have safe commerce We have to acknowledge that. So oil in the U.S. military in World War One, largely a horse-drawn military. Right? So, so the amount of oil used was less than one gallon per soldier per day. World War Two, despite all the you know tanks and aircraft and all that, still less than two gallons per soldier per day. Now in Vietnam, that jumped up to ten gallons. I think that was really reflective of the fact that you had the UH-1 Huey helicopter that was used as a mobility source to take troops in theater, and also as a kind of an air ambulance uh, that, that saved a lot of folks on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the Iraq War, 30 gallons per day per soldier. So over time, you know, I guess if you were Militaries using more energy. These are the global choke points around the world. Uh, so, uh, certainly the Strait of Hormuz, uh, you have a lot of oil flowing through it. This is where the Iranians you know, have been active at times with you know, their fast attack uh, speedboats and things like that. That's a piece of shale rock. That has not only oil but natural gas in it. And if you look at the porosity and the permeability, I mean, that, that you won't, <laughs> you won't get too deep into this. And this really kind of shows you where the primary shale plays are in the United States. Really, most of the money right now is going into Texas, right, right around the Texas area. And one of the big developments in the shale drilling is also the ability to drill horizontally. So you could basically, instead of, you know, historically you have to like, take the rig from point A to the point of the drill right here, you have to move it away from the point of the drill. It's very costly to just sit and move it. And so with new technology, you can horizontal direction of drilling and just kind of move, move your drill string. And so that, that technology really made this much, much more efficient. So your theory that there is pretty well exaggerated in the shale flows and the pipes, the drilling pipes are all vertical. Yeah. Vertical. Yeah. So that's going to be a fairly slow flow of going on for all day. Yeah. And you're still going to bring this stuff back and forth in terms of what it's going to be. We all know the hazards of well, we get pipelines, we get moving crude by rail, crude by rail circuits, dams. Let's see. Uh, 
climate change, uh, Jim Maddog Mattis viewed climate change as a national security challenge. Um, so certainly I think the United States has 750 roughly bases and or outposts globally. Uh, some of those in the, in the military actually, you know, believe it or not, sees a lot of these changes through satellite technology and just through being having boots on the ground and they're noticing changes and threats that those pose. The biggest threat, obviously, I think, is, is global migration. Because once you have one or two, you know, if, you have, if you have sea level rise in a place like Bangladesh, you're going to have tens of millions of people who are going to be moving there. And those people, you know, and this, and these, these types of things are happening all over the world. So climate change is a big, big factor in geopolitics. Yeah, I mean the production has gone down. It hasn't recovered since the since the pandemic. But is that because of environmental Not really, no. It's I mean uh, yeah, the or price is yeah. doesn't doesn't make a Yeah, the oil companies just are not investing in the cost. They've cut way back on oil companies and ventures. Part of it, you know, politically is because the administration, I mean, you have an administration who is not as friendly towards the oil industry, so the you know, oil industry is less apt to invest in large amount of projects just because they don't want to have to spin out on EPA and other restrictions. But, um, and they do, they are making profits now, but they're making tens of billions of dollars in profits. So we have our Tesla, and then we have our electric Airbus. That is just a CGI. <laughs> <laughs> it so, so I, I figured you had carbon sequestration as part of your presentation. Oh, sure. No, no, no. So, so two weeks ago, I think on 60 Minutes did a great, great thing. Carbon sequestration in Iceland. And the oil companies actually are investing in carbon sequestration. And I think it, you know, I think that's a factor that will help with, with reducing the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. But there's a net energy when you talk about the cost of running mm -hmm. systems, so to speak. So there has to be a net cost to it. Right. Yeah, in Iceland, and I think the key on the 60 Minutes episode is in Iceland, you get geothermal. Geothermal is actually, so you have a clean, zero emission electric power source. Whereas if you do it in the West Texas fields, you're probably using an electric uh, electricity plant. Right. So, so companies are investing in hydrogen. You've got blue hydrogen, green hydrogen, I mean, all sorts. Exxon's investing tens of millions of dollars. Uh, other companies as well. So, I mean, those are those are being invested. In. So, Lindy, which is a company we own, um, it's it's a, I think it's equivalent in Europe as Air Liquide. Liquide. Lindy, it used, it used to be Faxair. Um, they do a lot of gases and things like that, oxygen and all sorts of gases. Um, they're they're I think a key partner in all of those are oil companies. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I think one of the challenges with the with the grid is, you know, you build these um, renewable sources of power, right? But they're kind of power on demand. So the wind only generally blows at a certain time. The sun is only out at a certain time. So you're creating these energy sources that, unless they're used immediately, really need to be stored in batteries. The, the good news here is the battery prices are coming down. Battery storage technologies are improving. Prices are coming down. Next year, energy is a global leader in, um, what do they call it? solar and wind um, plant construction. And they're building it out around these battery facilities to hold that so that when the grid needs it, in whatever way that may be, then it can be put into the system. So we're making progress there. I think we're still a long way.
So, so you got to get a prediction. So, so in, in any of your charts, did you have a model of natural gas and oil for person? You, you didn't have that. No, no. Right. So, so my question to you would be, and the audience, What's being captured there then is now being lost to the community. So, so we may not have reached a peak because population levels are and income are going up, so people are using more BT, more BT is across the board, hence more oil, but the percentage is inevitably going to be eroding. So so per person, we probably be eroding at the same percentage. Probably in the United States, yeah. And yeah. probably worldwide, you think? Or, or okay. we're still, and they're still really building coal, coal plants. Yeah, right now. Yeah, and we, we have a lot of emerging markets and stuff that are probably still. They're probably still on the ocean. Yeah. Right. Okay, I, I just don't have any. No, it's a good question. I, yeah. Because I, I mean, to me, I, I like that idea of just the water desert. You start to build because because I guess you need water, right? For the soil, you still need water. So I think there was some water jobs that the place is still there. Right? I think that's pretty pretty smart. Well, I read it's about thirty seven million people in the states. So everybody should be surrounded by water supplies because it's going to be forty million. Last drop of water. Such a California kind of thing that one can do what we can before we, but we need that to be ready. And I think we have the last drop. So I think that everybody should be in charge of the water supply of the state of that. The question is at what point in this point does it make sense to put a fish in this hole and then we know that a lot of that water is going to be missing. Yeah, so I know what you're talking about. We don't, yeah, there's not, there's not, we have a pretty strong knot in my backyard, it, like a NIMBY, you know? It's very expensive to go and we have a fairly short hand.